Welcome into another edition of the MMA Report Podcast. Of course, I'm Jason Foy. As always, I'm joined by Daniel Galvalz. We're here to talk about everything going on in the world of mixed martial arts. Of course, we come in following UFC Vegas 92, which saw Lerone Murphy go out there and remain unbeaten in the UFC. Had to survive that early front kick there at the end of the first round. Goes on and dominates there. Rounds two through five to get the decision victory. We'll talk about that. Also talk about Angela Hill finally getting a stoppage victory as she had been on a streak of 11 straight fights of going the distance. Also, we'll go into the MMA news bag as there has been a ton of MMA news that has happened over the past couple of days. Interesting comments from Tyron Woodley. Conor McGregor does an interview talking about what he wants to do in 2024. UFC 304 has been revealed. The fight card has been revealed. Of course, it was a week ago, Daniel. We're sitting here. We're debating on whether Bilal Muhammad is going to get a title shot or not. Bilal Muhammad is getting a title shot. We'll talk about UFC 304. Maybe Lerone Murphy ends up being on that card there in Manchester. And then, of course, we're going to end this show giving our June draft of fights where Daniel and I will both pick. We'll go uh, fi- our top five fights. We'll go do a, a little snake draft in terms of that one. And I was telling Daniel, right before we started the show. Uh, to me, there is a very clear top five fights in the month of June, so we'll talk about that. Of course, Daniel, it is, I can't believe this, that it's Memorial Day weekend already is here. Like, I feel like it was just like January not that long ago. And, you know, for us OGs uh, of the MMA game, you know, us old heads, Daniel, like I remember when Memorial Day weekend was always like a big weekend for the UFC. Yeah, and now we look at this weekend and, We got a whole lot of nothing to look forward to. I mean, this is almost a bye week if you're a mixed martial arts fan. It's crazy how time changes. And uh, here we are just looking at, I guess, what, hanging out with our family and friends this weekend, maybe having a couple daddy sodas. No mixed martial arts to watch. We had our little mixed martial arts action this past weekend. But, yeah, the sport changes so much, Jason, and – Damn, we got a lot to talk about. Even though there's no UFC event, we got a lot of BS to talk about on this podcast. It's going to be a fun one. Oh, yeah, man. There is just, uh, I was over there on the MMA Red channel. Uh, you know, as I was preparing for this yesterday, and just a ton of things there. I mean, the Khalil Roundtree Jr. story, I think, is a very interesting story as we are now in the. Uh, the new era of UFC drug testing, and uh, I, I saw someone compare to what his suspension is in terms of the suspension that Bobby Green has gotten, maybe how this the terms of the suspension is going to lay down terms. So we'll talk about that as we go on there. But, Daniel, of course, last weekend was UFC Vegas 92. As uh, Ron Murphy, as I mentioned right at the start of the show, remains unbeaten in the UFC, goes out there and gets a decision victory against Edson Barboza, 49-46, 50-45, and 52-45. Uh, first off, I have no problem with the 49-46 scorecard. I mean, look, I, I think we'll all sit there and agree rounds two through five, no question, or the Rome Murphy rounds. But, man, that up kick with about 10 seconds left in the opening round was clearly the most damaging strike that got land in the opening round. Um, you know, I think, you know, prior to that, it was it was definitely a Murphy round. I mean, even though Edson Barboza, I thought, land some really good kicks. But, like, if you tell me Barboza would have had 30 more seconds left in the opening round to try to finish that fight, he might have finished that fight because I don't know if Murphy was out, but he was rocked. Yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy, and that was almost like, damn, we got ourselves another highlight reel Edson win, and you are right. If that happened in the middle of the round, Barboza may be the big winner here, but all in all, I mean, their own Murphy proved that like he's ready to be a top 10 featherweight in this fight. This was one of the more one-sided beatings we saw Edson take for the other four rounds. I mean, to me, aside from Barboza nearly winning in round one, the big story of the fight is how hard it is to knock out Edson Barboza. Because throughout this fight, Murphy was connecting with accurate strikes and Barboza was just like a Robocop. He was just like a zombie. He just kept on coming. This was um, outside of round one. This was a statement from Lerone Murphy. He went out in the main event, and he basically said, hey, I'm a top 10 featherweight. Let's get it going. And uh, overall, it was a great performance that showcased his wrestling takedowns in addition to the fact that he can go out with one of the best strikers we've seen in the UFC, the highlight reel man in the Edson, and outstrike him for 25 minutes. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was a very solid performance by Ron Murphy, and I'm with you. I think that he should get a top 10 matchup. Uh, I know he was on Ariel's show earlier this week. He mentioned that, hey, if his nose is not broken, he would love to fight in Manchester, a UFC 304. And, you know, I, one of the matchups I saw, you, you know, you know, there's all these articles out there about matches to make following whatever the UFC card is. And I saw someone mention him versus Josh Emmett. Don't mind that one. I, I you know, If you tell me it's him and Josh Emmett at UFC 304, him on Allen, even even like Aljo, even though stylistically may not be the most fun, exciting fight to watch just because of, of kind of what it is, but like it is very clear that Roman Murphy deserves a top 10 opponent. Yeah, I mean, if you look at fighters who don't have a fight, Aljamain Sterling is, is up there in terms of he fits the formula the UFC likes to do, the established star versus the up-and-coming fighter. It is something where... You do wonder maybe Aljo is going to be in a different track because maybe that's someone that you want to have challenged for the title. So you want to put him in a position where he's climbing up rather than being used as a stepping stone. It's also a fight. I don't think Murphy wins, to be honest with you. I, I think for Leroy Murphy, you're looking at him versus the winner, or maybe Arnold Allen and Giga Chikadze. I think those two just got announced for July. And um, the idea of Chikadze striking with Murphy is something that is very exciting for me. I mean, Diego Lopez on the outside of the top 10, number 14, he says he's got a fight announced. We'll see who it is. I know the UFC likes making – I know the UFC likes coming to fighters an hour after they fight and having to make fights. So <laughs> maybe that's what happened, and that's who Murphy is taking on next. Yeah, I just saw that. Arnold Al G. Kaze, UFC 304. We'll talk more about UFC 304 later on in the show. And you mentioned a stat to me following these fights about Angela Hill, the fact of she snaps an 11-fight streak where she had gone to decision in 11 straight fights. Her first stoppage victory since 2020, Daniel. Unbelievable. Good for her. Um, man, she's just one of those fighters you watch fight, and you just feel good when she does well. She's been around a very long time. Uh, host, host a podcast, Jessica Panay, good personality, gets the guillotine choke, and uh, yeah, an unbelievable streak ended. We saw history made across the board in women's MMA at this fight night. I mean, we saw somebody win via boot punch. Hadn't seen that before, but we saw that in the fight between um, Melissa Gatto and Vidal. Why more fighters don't punch each other in the tits uh, is beyond me. I mean, it's like if I could hit someone in the balls – and it's legal, that would be more effective than a calf kick. And I am not a woman, but I believe it gets it hurts being hit there. So I, if that's not illegal, I don't know why more fighters don't just strike the, the boop. Like, like again, like that seems like that's a really effective strike, and I haven't read the MA rules, but apparently it's legal, I guess. So, like, why, why is that not an offensive approach? Why is that not a strategy? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, 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 again, I've never been a woman, um, but I believe that's a sensitive area. You know, you see people attack the, the leg, the khaki. Why are people not jabbing the boot? You know, unbelievable. Uh, I, I feel like uh, if that is that that is something you can do, you should do until it gets uh, banned. But um, that was a crazy uh, history making performance out of Melissa Gatto. Mentioned about, uh, you know, I was reading this article about fights to make after UFC Vegas 72. One of the ones I really did like was, of course, Chaos Williams goes out there and gets a first round knockout there in 90 seconds against Carlson Harris. Mentioned Chaos Williams versus Urus Medic. Uh, that's a fight that uh, signed me up for. I think that would be a very fun fight to uh, put out there. Uh, Thimbo Grimbo goes out there and gets a win. Uh, Adrian Yanez goes out there. Uh, I'm not really surprised. It's kind of what I did expect in terms of that one of Salvador moving up. Two one hundred and thirty five pounds there, but uh, of course that that's what happened at UFC Vegas ninety two. Also, we had Bellator Paris, and uh, you, you mentioned a great point right before the show is if you're going to go out there and tell us you're the best band of weight in the world, you got to have you, you got to go out there and dominate. And there is a case to say that Patchy Mix maybe should have lost last Friday in Paris. Yeah, Magomed Magomedov is a very talented fighter. He showed it over the weekend, but we're talking about making a case for being the best fighter in the weight class. And if you do that, when you get put in the cage with Magomed Magomedov, there can't be any questions on who won that fight. That's what happened on, on the Bellator card is mixing Magomed Magomedov fought a very close fight really comes down to how you viewpoint scoring on the stand up 
how you rate volume versus significant strikes. But it was a close fight. I mean, Mix got hurt early on in that matchup. It wasn't one of these performances where he didn't look as dominant as Murab has looked in some of his fights. And it's hard to say he's better than Sean O'Malley with the main event like that. It's great he went out there and won. But again, on some scorecards, he didn't even win that fight. So for Patchy, it was probably... I mean, it's positive that he still keeps his championship. But when it comes to, is this guy the best Bantamweight in the world? I don't know how you can watch him fight Malcolm Ben Ragamedov and say, yes, he is. And I got to say, I was watching this Bellator card. I saw all the fights, including the prelims. And, man, I enjoyed some of the – like that first fighter, uh, Asej Adjuj in featherweight, he looks really good. Archie Colgan, again, looks really good, just dominated. And then to me, I mean, the biggest story outside of the main event is Cedric Kadumbe is just – he, uh, you know, I – it was crazy what happened in that fight with Jaleel Willis where he kind of dropped down and immediately he sprawled back up and then like Jaleel Willis completely tripped over and, and face planted. But uh, Dumbe just seems like a different cat, man. He just is. And the idea of him versus Pettis is just like, ooh, that's a good fight. And uh, he's one of the more excited people on this Bell Tour slash PFL roster that we actually get to see fight. Yeah, I think on the Dumambe and Pettis potential fight booking is, I mean, look, if you're a PFL, if you truly do understand fight promotion and how to put on fights, if you do not put that fight on in Paris, that is a clear sign that they, I, I don't, I, it's tough to have a lot of faith in them. We'll talk about some of the comments that Don Davis had to say is uh, there are some very uh, disgruntled, notable fighters uh, who have who are under Bellator contract. But, you know, you mentioned about those scorecards for Patchy Mix and, and Magomedov here is. And the three judges who scored this fight, they really were not in agreement. I mean, it was, look, it was a tough, it was a very close fight. I mean, it was a razor-thin fight. Uh, David Peabody uh, was the judge that scored it 49-46 for Magomedov as he gave rounds one through four to Magomedov and the fifth round to Patchy Mix. Mark Collette had it 48-47 for Patchy Mix, giving Patchy the second, third, and fifth with the first and fourth going to Magomedov. And then Hadi Muhammad Ali had the fight 48-47 for Patchy Mix, scoring the first, fourth, and fifth round for Patchy Mix. And then the second and third for Magomedov. Nobly, he was the only judge that gave the fourth round to Apache Mix there. Um, and, of course, Mark Collette was the only judge that gave the second and third round to Apache Mix. So, scorecards all over the place. Yeah, I feel real strongly about round two going to Magomedov. I just thought he had the most significant moment in that round, even though Mix rebounded, did well. I, I, I'm leaning more towards Magomedov in round two. But it goes to show you how close that fight was. And it's just like, damn, you know, should we do a trilogy fight between these two? I mean, there were some instances where Mix tried to repeat what he did in the first round with a guillotine choke, just wasn't able to. But uh, from a stand-up standpoint, it wasn't an A-plus out of Patchy. Uh, you know, I think some other notes for me in terms of this card. I, I think for uh, Slim Trebesky, that was probably supposed to be a little bit of a showcase fight. Really wasn't a showcase fight out there. He had a little bit of a dog fight uh, in, in terms of that one. Um, you know, watching this fight live, the Aspen Lad fight, the, the commentators are talking about how close this fight is. It could go either way. And I'm sitting here, I got the live odds right in front of me. I'm like, Aspen Lad's minus 2,000 in live odds. <laughs> Obviously, the batters who are betting this card do not believe this fight is anywhere uh, close into into that one. But it was a great environment they had over there uh, in Paris. And, of course, their next fight card uh, coming up June 22nd in Dublin, which I did not realize this till when I was kind of putting some things together. Actually, the same day as the uh, UFC card in Saudi Arabia. Of course, that's going to be a fight card that's going to be on ABC, headlined by Robert Whitaker and Hamzat Chamayev. So overall, not a, not a bad weekend of fights. Now, Daniel, as we get into the MMA news folder, I always feel like we got to start PFL Bellator. Oh, we got to. So yeah. we, we have all seen the, the various disgruntled Bellator fighters. We've seen Chris Cyborg. Just a couple of days ago, it was Douglas Lima. Now it's Gegard Mousasi. Douglas Lima uh, tweeted this over on May 17th. He says, last guy I beat is fighting for the belt now. Talking about Castillo Vincenas. Solid win for Costello. Great job. 
I'm on the sidelines for a year now. What I've heard was my purse was too high and PFL didn't want to pay and honor my last fight on my contract. Thumbs down emoji. So yeah, at Bells or MMA at PFL MMA. And uh, there were some notable responses to it. Of course, one was from Chris Cyborg or Maybe it was one of Chris Cyborg's uh, representatives here uh, where it was tweeted. I'm having a hard time getting about agreement sent to me too. And one of the uh, two other things that really stuck out to me was uh, a tweet from Christian Prina. For people who don't know, Christian worked for Bellator during the Bjorn days, uh, was one of those guys that was around for about the first six months of the Scott Coker era. Then uh, he's now in the casino business. And he, he posted to response to this, such bullshit. If they can't fight you, they should release you, period. And then, of course, Gegor Mousasi uh, had his comments yesterday uh, where uh, Gegor Mousasi, and this is a, a, a tweet from MMA Fighting, Gegor Mousasi says he believes his team will take legal action against BFL. Quote, they don't even want to pick up their phone and just talk to us. I fought for a lot of organizations. This is the worst one. And, I mean, look, Daniel, there's always going to be, you know, three sides of the story. There's going to be the fighter side, the promotion side, and maybe the the truth is somewhere in the middle. But so Don Davis was on the Weighing In podcast, Daniel. And I, I loved when I sent you this tweet, and you're just like, what the hell does this mean? Don Davis on Kayla Harrison leading the PFL for the UFC. Some people are at the very top of their career are LeBron James, and some are the very top are Kevin Durant, and they're both overly basketball, overly basketball players, but they are in a very different as people. One wants to lead and change their sport, and wherever they are is the best in the world. The other is a follower who needs validation, and we couldn't do anything about that. Look, oh, man, the only thing that makes less sense than that is what podcast Dana White is on each week. I mean, each week it makes no sense. I'm just like, I've never heard of this podcast. Uh, Dana White is on it, and he's going viral for this. Like, it's uh, it, it's perplexing to me what podcast Dana White chooses to go on. Uh, it's interesting, but it's just, it's just like, I'm just wondering, like, how is he figuring out, like, I'm going to go on Surviving uh, Life Through Excellence with uh, blah, blah, blah. Like, like, I just don't understand, but uh, hopefully he doesn't go on Andrew Tate's podcast. Look, I think when Dana White goes on these podcasts, because I, I there was a tweet last week of, of some podcast he was on. He was talking about, you know, the the analytics of power slap on, on social media in comparison to other sports. And I always feel like Dana's at this point, like he just he's saying things. He just wants he knows the people he's gonna piss off when he says these things. And like it's still one of these things of when I see people get overly up in arms about what he says, I'm like you guys do realize there's people who love the hell out of power slap. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I just don't understand what po- why he's going on these podcasts. Like, it's great that he's going on these podcasts, but it's just like, I've never heard of these podcasts. How does this come across his front desk? How does he choose it? It's fine. He gets some good stories out of it. I mean, yeah, he wants to go on places where people aren't going to, like, fact check him. But, um, yeah, I digress. I um, This was a tipping point. This week was a tipping point in the way the general MMA public feels about PFL. It was just one too many fighters coming out and saying they have been mistreated. You say there's three sides of every story, and you are correct. But once you hear a lot of different sides from one side of the story, you start to have a more clear picture of what's going on. Whenever Gegard Mousasi is talking shit about you, you screwed up. If Cyborg's talking shit about you, I mean, she wakes up in the morning ready to talk shit, whether it's her or her manager. She 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 spent her whole career talking shit. Gegard Mousasi has spent his whole career being quiet. When he says you were the worst promotion he's ever worked for, his words truly mean something. Because he doesn't talk out of his ass like Don Davis has for the entire time Don Davis has been in the forefront. Don Davis consistently says stupid shit all the time. And it's so annoying. Uh, Every quote we get from him is just, this guy is just completely full of shit. This is the, there are a couple big issues with the PFL. One, 
The inability for the promotion to communicate with these fighters is absurd. It is absurd that these fighters feel like not only are they on ice, they can't even talk to this promotion, that the communication is not happening. This is a problem that Chris Cyborg cited. But again, because Chris Cyborg consistently is in controversies, it doesn't really, it doesn't stick. When Gegard, when Douglas Lima talk about it, in addition to Chris Cyborg already talking about it, it's clear this is what's happening. The PFL has been a joke. Signing Francis Ngannou not getting them inside the cage has been a joke. It's clear at this point that the PFL has been bad for the high-level Bellator fighters that got signed. They've basically retired these fighters without their consent. So at the beginning of Ariel's show yesterday, when he was doing his listener Q&A, he was talking about some things he's heard with Bellator. And it was, you know, talking about some of these higher-end contracts. And what Ariel talked about was something I had heard a couple months ago, that there were some fighters who, as, as the right before the sell happened, got new contracts, extended their contracts out, and they're making high money. So Don Davis was on the Weighing In podcast yesterday, and this comes from a story over at MMA Junkie. The story reads, Davis said he understood when PFL overtook Bellator's operations, there would be some unforeseen issues, though he expected more hiccups in the process. He made it clear he's pleased with where things stood overall with both PFL and Bellator and added he is actively working to resolve any outstanding issues with athletes. Quote, Occasionally, we'll have a fighter grumble. It's one of 205 fighters that we acquire from Bellator. We expect 5 to, five to 10% issues on any deal. You can't be perfect. You can be what 90 to 95%. We've had a handful of people say, oh, I wish it went this way. I wish it went that way. I'm delighted. I'm very, very proud of how we treat our fighters, how we treat our employees, most of all the product. We just completed our second Bellator show in Paris, which was awesome. We didn't sit on this for six months. We didn't take a year off. We didn't lay off 100 fighters, all the stuff that always happens in all acquisitions. So I just could not be more proud. I'll say two things. One, what I'm super proud of is the market and anyone you talk to, fighters, business partners, media, managers, were direct and fair and reasonable, 100%. That's my 35 years in business. That's the culture we've built here. So I will say, without commenting out of respect on individual negotiations and specific situations, we're direct, fair, and reasonable with everybody that we deal with. Will everyone's contracts be honored? Of course. Do some people have different ideas of how that works and what doesn't work? Sure, but we're fair and reasonable with everyone. With all 205 fires from Bellas, where we have everything fall the way they want? No. There's a lot you can take away from that. Um, I thought that was a very um, PR type answer that was probably told this is how you're going to answer that question. Um, I, I think one of the things of, you know, and, and PFL is always talking about how they're fighters first, Daniel. That's the whole thing. Fighters first, fighters first, they're fighters not. first. They're absolutely not. They're absolutely not. It's, but this it's, will, it's, it's over now. This okay. idea of them being fighters first is done. I know Francis Ngannou is dealing with a tragedy in his life. We know Jake Paul has been come out and talked about being an advocate for fighters. It's we're, we're at this stage now. We're going to truly find out. Do they want to be advocates for other PFL fighters or are they just an advocate for themselves? It, it's clear. It's the latter. I mean, the, the quote from, from Don Davis is full of shit. He says they're direct. Several other fighters say they aren't direct. They aren't communicating. They, they, they feel like they are, <laughs> in a relationship they're trying to woo a, a hot girl or a hot guy and the hot guy, hot girl won't talk to them. It's, 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 it's clear that they aren't direct. And it's not only impacting Bellator acquired fighters. I mean, Larissa Pacheco hasn't received a bout offer to fight this year. Kayla Harrison was put on ice. The idea that she left the PFL cause she's Kevin Durant is not that she left the PFL cause she wasn't, she wanted to be LeBron James. She wanted to be the f player recognized as the best in the world. 
and she wasn't even getting any fights at the PFL. You go back, you look at Chris Wade's complaints back in the day about the PFL, <clears throat> and those start to have much more validity. After a while, if you start smelling, maybe it wasn't, you know, somebody else at parties. Maybe it was you that shit your pants. And the PFL has been shitting their pants uh, time in and time out. And at some point, it's just like enough's enough. This is your reputation. You know, you come into a market and you got to be something different than the big dog. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways the PFL could have been different is that they could have treated fighters better and not taken advantage of fighters and not played dirty tactics with fighters. They failed in all three aspects. They, they don't want to pay big money to get these belts or fighters in the cage. Release them. Allow Gegard Musasi to fight somewhere else. He's a legend of the sport, and he deserves that. Chris Cyborg deserves that. Douglas Lima deserves that. Larissa Pacheco, who went out there and beat freaking Kayla Harrison, deserves to get fights in the cage, even if it's the smart cage. Yeah, I'll mention some tweets here uh, from Ant Evans. Ant uh, was a formerly with the UFC as a PR director now, uh, helps out people in terms of the YouTube monetization. And one of his, uh, he quote tweeted uh, this this video of Ariel talking about the PFL situation. And Ant tweeted, he says, PFL bought Bellatar. They wanted the pundits look at our co-leader roster, but apparently didn't want the responsibility that comes with buying a business. Not paying fire medical bills for injury sustained in fights is a disgrace on honoring fight contracts is a disgrace. PFL is fighter friendly, like the Catholic Church is child friendly. Oof. Oof. I, I will say this though: the medical bill aspect with the Sabah Hamasi thing, it is that is so that happened under the paramount ownership of Bellator. That is an issue that PF that PFL believes that. Paramount slash Viacom should be the one paying the bill. It's not them, but of course, ultimately, you, you did buy the roster. Then another uh, pair of tweets here from Ann Evans. He says, Don co-leader Davis, excuse for stifling ex-Bellator fires is like Gegard Masasi is. They signed their deals with Bellator. We don't got to honor them. UFC honored all sorts of crappy deals from SEG, Pride, etc. Not just fight contracts either, but crazy business deals. But yeah, let's hear again how evil the UFC is and how fire-friendly PFL is. PFL is a layer cake of bullshit. And one of the um, comments that Ant made following this tweet was, wow, a lot of people sliding into my DMs expressing their view that the worm has finally turned on the co-leaders. You're muted. Simply put, this sport deserves a better co-leader than what we got right now. Pro, pro, can, can we please, Don, just stop saying that word. Like, stop. Stop saying that word. Like, yeah. stop saying co-leader. Like, like every time, like, it's one of those things, like, it's like every time he says that, he should have to take a shot to Keela right as he says it. If you are a mixed martial arts fighter. The number two promotion where you can fight and make a living is bare knuckle. That's where we're at now. PFL has dropped the ball. They just have the you know the fight card belt from Paris was fine. It was nice. The tournaments are fine. They're nice. Can't treat fighters this way. I mean, you can, but you can't get away with it without your reputation being hurt. And the PFL reputation is in a bad way. And Don Davis doesn't fix any fires. It's like he sees a fire and he goes in there with a big bucket, but the bucket just has more gasoline and it lights it and makes it bigger. The guy is like Ned Flanders in The Simpsons. He just keeps on stepping mm-hmm. on rakes. He's got to shut up. I, I mentioned... Reason, I guess someone who's got more... Um, and Like someone who has more integrity to be running to be a leader of your promotion because he's got no integrity and he's got no respectability because he consistently says things that aren't true I mentioned, a, I mentioned a couple other tweets i saw this is coming from uh, john nash obviously uh, a great source when it comes to the the business side uh, of mma so he quote tweeted this video from uh, jedi goodman where uh, the quote from gegard masasi was i don't know why he even took belts or 
if you don't have the money to let the fighters fight. And Nash's uh, re- uh, quote tweet on this was, last few years, PFL has supposedly burning through $50 million plus a year. Doesn't seem like acquiring Bellator is going to lower that rate. And then he has another tweet where it, it talks about uh, the same video that Gabriel Mustassi had that quote in. He says he was also seems somewhat unbelievable that PFL would be sp- surprised by Musasi's contract, considering how I believe they retain Bellator's VP of Business and Legal Affairs, George Pineda, who would have looked over the deal when Musasi had originally signed it. Yeah. Just put the emoji, hmm, of <laughs> that one. I mean, it is, I mean, look, and I also think the fact of how quiet that PFL has been on this, I think is also very telling. I mean, look, there is very much a thing of to handle things behind the scenes, but I think this is a, ultimately a story of if you are truly fighters first, why is it that you have notable fighters who are clearly making a ton of money are sitting there saying, I want to fight. Let me fight. And and look, if you don't want to pay Gegard Musasi, you know, see if there is some way you can both meet in the middle, whether he is, is it in the fight in PFL, fight in Bellator, or you know what? Just release him. Let him go. Let him go find a new home. It, it's just insane that PFL Brass has spent more time communicating with podcasters than their own fighters. These podcasters are serving as middlemen for the fighters in the promotion because the promotion is not talking to Gegard. They're not talking to Cyborg. It's insane. Before we start pulling back, before we start criticizing PFL for the big mistakes, like not getting these people fights, you got to look and peel back the layers and being like, they aren't even communicating with these fighters. What the hell is going on? And that has to be the biggest part of this is, I mean, look, even if you, you have an issue with fighter, I, how is, how is there not someone picking up the phone or I don't know the fact that gay guard Musasi was in Paris cornering a fighter. Like there wasn't a point where I know Peter Murray was there. Obviously Mike Kogan was there. Can we not get in a room and have a conversation? Or is it is it one of these situations where you're just trying to kick the can down the road and you don't want to deal with it right now? Yeah. It just sounds like they're the Kevin Durant of mixed martial arts, man. So I, that, that is Don Davis. If you're hearing this, whoever gave you that idea – to go with that analogy, they need to be fired. Like, I, I just, at the no, end of the day. Being, being fired is not how the PFL does things. They really want to punish people. They'll just sign them and not have them work. Look, at the end of the day, and whether Don Davis wants to accept this or not, the reality is, as a fighter, in, a, in mixed martial arts, if your goal is to be known as the best fighter in your division or being the best fighter of all time, I'm sorry, you can't do that in the PFL. Yes, you can make a ton of money, but there becomes a point where that fighter says, I want the recognition of being the top fighter. Kayla Harrison wants to be known as the best female fighter of all time. She can't do that in PFL. Yes, maybe you could put the, the Chris Cyborg fight together. Okay, cool. That would be a great resume builder. But the reality is she wants to go to the UFC, and she wants to, you know, fight all the top contenders. All You know, potentially maybe bring some man Nunez out of retirement. So, like, I get where you could be frustrated that – the fighter who has truly been the face of your organization from, from day one uh, when the transition from WSL to PFL happened. But, like, it, she wants to be known as the best fighter in the world. You can't do that in the PFL. You just can't. No, she couldn't even get a fight. She couldn't even compete because they were playing contract games. If you're a mixed martial artist and you want to be a fighter and you want to go out there and fight, I can't advise you to sign a contract with the PFL because they've played stupid games with fighters, but they don't put them in the cage to let them compete. UFC plays similar games sometimes. They may have played that game with Conor McGregor, 
But by and large, it's happening at a high rate of the PFL compared to what it should be happening, which is not it should when these fighters are ready to fight, they should be able to fight. That's what they do. Their careers are so short. He he was wasting his career. Her career. And to compare her to Kevin Durant, well, first off, it's a good thing because Kevin Durant is one of the best players of all time. But the way in which he was phrasing it is just downright stupid. And he's coming across as like David Kahn. Who, if you don't know who David Kahn was, one of the worst GMs in NBA history for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Drafted three point guards in a draft in the same draft as Steph Curry. Steph Curry didn't end up on the Wolves, but Johnny Flynn did. That's the NBA comparison I've got. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's move over to the MMA news bag. And I guess since we're talking about fighter pay, I guess we'll, we'll talk about this tweet I first saw from Luke Thomas. Uh, this comes from May 19th. It says, UFC flyweight Maria Agapova says on Instagram tonight that in a week, I'll probably be homeless. Agapova last be at UFC Vegas 60 in September 2022. A 27-year-old complained in March of this year about being unable to secure a fight. And Agapova said this, quote, I have two more fights under my contract in the UFC. Because of the contract, I can't fight in other places and promotions to make money. I also train two to three times a day because of this, and I'm not able to get a job. Thank you very much, all my friends, sponsors, and tattoo clients for their help. But I urgently need a contract for the fight. My documents have been in order for a month now. And it's just not clear when I'll sign the contract for the fight. Let's make some noise. Write to the UFC that you missed my fights. When is the fight? Don't ask me that. Let me ask the UFC matchmaker, Mick Maynard, when will my fight be happening? And she is supposed to be fighting in July. And, you know, Daniel, this is one of those stories that you see on MMA social media where I think it's very easy to just take the perception of, oh, man, another classic situation of, the the you know the the hardships that fighters take but i also think like okay what's the ufc side of the story and also we all make bad dumb financial decisions how much of that is related of you know maybe maria agapova hasn't made the greatest financial decisions over the last year i mean look i guess the tough to be a fighter michael johnson talked about how basically when he didn't fight for a year he was dead broke I, I feel bad for the fighter here, but I also like it's one of these stories where I'm just not going to sit here and make this a fighter pay story because we're only getting a piece of the story. Yeah. It's just, unfortunately, Maria, um, she's got to, I mean, first off, there's a, a part of her quote that's really alarming and should be looked into where she says she's being uh, sold uh, somebody who's trying to sex traffic her, which is just like, that's insane. She needs to go to the authorities if that is what transpired, she needs to talk to the authorities and get that sorted out because that's more important than anything else. That's a that's a dangerous crime. Uh, Maria Agapova is someone who has been in the news before for controversies surrounding Marina Moros, for controversies being kicked out of gyms. Um, clearly, the UFC isn't the greatest place to work in terms of financially. Um, some fighters do have to have multiple jobs along with side being a fighter. So she just isn't the most reliable narrator for this particular narrative. This is one of those things where you start to poke holes at her story. You start to say, if you train two to three times, like maybe you shouldn't, like maybe you should find another way of making money if you aren't going to fight since 2022 and you have a losing record in the UFC and, you know, the UFC will probably cut you if you, if you lose your next fight. Um, so, yeah, Maria Agapova, unfortunately, because of her history of being in the news for controversies, isn't the most reliable narrator. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's we, we all know that fighters are not getting the type of money they should be getting. But, like, it's also one of these things I, I sit back and just say, I think there potentially is, it could be a little bit more to the story. Uh, we'll move over to Khalil Roundtree Jr. As uh, he revealed on his Instagram that uh, he tested positive for a banned substance and, and self-reported this one. And then it came out yesterday uh, that he has been accepted a two-month sanction from the Combat Sports Anti-Doping uh, Agency here as uh, the statement over at UFC.com says combat sports anti-doping announced today that Khalil Roundtree of Las Vegas, Nevada has accepted a two-month sanction for a violation of the UFC anti-doping policy. 
Roundtree self-reported to the UFC personnel that he mistakenly the use of a dietary supplement that contained DHEA, a prohibited at all times anabolic steroid, as one of its several ingredients. Shortly after being used of the supplement, a biological sample was collected by Drug Free Sport International from Roundtree on May 4, 2024, and was shipped to and tested by the Sports Medicine Research Testing Laboratory in Salt Lake City, Utah. Smurda's isotope ratio mass spectrometry testing reflected that the sample was consistent with the extraneous origin of 5A, bunch of words I, I don't know how to pronounce correctly, uh, all being metabolites of DHEA. And I did see someone on X did point out that the fact that this is a very similar situation to Bobby Green that happened with him with USADA, USADA gave him a six-month suspension. So I guess we know the new era of UFC drug testing that we're in. You know what? I like it. Common sense prevailed in this situation. He was notified that he would took a tin supplement. He immediately told them, I did this. They this guy is 34 years old. He does he, he doesn't have much time left. He's really performing well. So to me, this was a common sense situation. A minor suspension. Let this get out of his system. They can keep on fighting. Because he clearly didn't intentionally take this. And the biggest thing is, once he found out he did, he went and ran to the officials and notified them. This is common sense prevailing, in my opinion. And uh, hopefully the Jamal Hill fight uh, happens. And it, it's, a, it's a fight I want to see. So I, I would like to see it. I think we'll see it. Uh, if it does happen, it would be two months from now. And so we'll see. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it's common sense. The only thing that would make more common sense is no suspension. It's just like, um, all right, you helped your body with this supplement. You're going to have to spend a week where you only eat McDonald's. Like maybe it's a counterbalance <laughs> where we're going to retroactively take away from any advantage you could have had. But uh, otherwise, Jason, this was a nice story in terms of when we first heard about it, my first mm -hmm. initial fear was this guy's going to get sidelined for a long time for something he didn't intentionally do. I like this. Now, one of the more crazy stories of the past week was Sean O'Malley revealing that his home in Arizona was swatted last weekend. So I don't know if you're familiar with this term. I became familiar with this term probably, I would say about six months ago as I produce a political podcast and their guest was talking about how this happened to them. And this comes from the story over MMA Junkie, where it says the act has increasingly uh, dramatically in recent years with the rise of social media and targets are often celebrities, internet and social media personalities who live stream some of their content. In some cases, the hoaxers can use a car ID hack to make it appear as if it's an emergency call is coming from the actual resident that makes up the perpetrators of swatting hoaxes even more difficult to track down. Quote, I heard about like Aiden Ross and the big streamers getting squatted, O'Malley said on the podcast. People find out where they're at and they call the cops and they say something happened that obviously didn't happen and then they're effing getting swatted. I peeked my head out the window to see if maybe it was something else. But then they're on the intercom and I see a bunch of cops. They're like, walk out with your hands up. So I effing walk out, hands up. I was like, I'm just going to listen. I could get shot. I was like, okay. I'll just listen to them. I'll be all right. But you never know. Someone sneezes, pulls a trigger. I've got effing shotguns pointing at me, AR 15 from four different cops pointing at me. And I was like, I'm just going to listen and walk back. O'Malley said he was going to, he was going to put into the back of the police car for more than a half hour of officer to investigate. He said the host call was a report that he had killed his parents. Quote, I was sitting in the back of that cop car in handcuffs, and I was like, dude, that's crazy. I had freedom five minutes ago. Now I have none. Zero. They said I killed my parents or something like that, and they thought there was an active shooter inside. Daniel, no matter what your thoughts of Sean O'Malley are, it's scary that a hoaxer can do this to somebody. Yeah, there have been situations where the victim has been harmed because it, it's a really tense situation. You can imagine if you're a police officer and you get told you have an active shooter where murder has taken place, you are just, you know, you, you are act. I mean, I don't know if somebody called 
last week and said, hey, Louisville PD, there's this golfer who murdered seven people, and he's on the loose. I don't know if Scotty Scheffler got hoaxed last swatted last uh, weekend, but uh, this is one of those deals where I don't know what the solution is because obviously it's hard to track these people, but that's insane that it happened. I mean, the solution is just figuring out how to hide your address as best as you possibly can if you're Sean O'Malley, putting it under somebody's name, do something or other, because that's an awful situation. Yeah, I mean, just absolutely scary ass situation that, that that someone can do that. But I mean, some of the memes last week of Scotty Chef were, I mean, were just absolutely amazing. Um, like there's one, this meme I saw, so it's a, his mugshot picture and the caption is her. Make sure you take a lot of pictures on your golf trip. The only picture that was taken. <laughs> a mugshot, I love it. Uh, man, what was, was some of the other one? I mean, like people had uh, his mugshot on t-shirts the day of that tournament um and then ha- have you ever seen the tiger photo where it's like he's going up and the caption is big dog uh-huh this caption i saw tiger woods picking up Sc- scotty Scheffler from the louisville police department yeah. by the way that that same that same tiger meme i saw uh uh this morning and it made me laugh the caption was when tiger finds out roy is now divorced it has another single bro to hang with Oh my God, that's crazy! <laughs> like, that, that's what, I'm telling you. That's one of those things. Of like, if if you told me I was going to do a podcast with Tiger, we're pulling up that photo, going, "All right, Tiger, what do you think of this?" <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I'm sure he has some time. He's looking at it, but uh, yeah, no, uh, Rory and Tiger on the prowl. Watch out, America! Yeah, man, cool. dude. It just- <laughs> He, he, watch out, Jupiter, Florida, for Rory and Tiger going out to the Waffle House, you know, after uh-huh. a night of drinks. You're going out to Twin Peaks, man. Oh man, yeah that that those those memes out there were absolutely tremendous. Uh, next up, we got uh, Tyler Woodley says he's planning to return to MMA. He was doing uh, a interview with Title Sports Network. Quote, to be honest, when I was fighting the last couple of MMA fights, it was just kind of like a simulation. The whole Apex Arena deal is kind of whack. It's like sparring session. I don't let people come watch me spar. I don't like it being in a weird, awkward room. The cage was super small, and I was just really wasn't motivated to be in a fight, especially at that time. Those fights to me are like exhibition fights. I do think that the fans deserve to see me go out there and see me run through somebody, see the Tyron Woodley that they know I'm capable of being, and put a proper close to my MMA career. So I'm planning for a big, big MMA fight, possibly in the Middle East. Talked about Nick Diaz. The one thing I would say that I did like what what Woodley had to say here is, is he's not coming out and just saying, hey, give me that top five guy or give me a title fight. I mean, but the thing is, is like Woodley, we saw those last couple of fights, man. Y- you love putting your back against the fence. Like, ugh. Yeah, he's like 42. It, it's. Is he that old already? He, yeah. Yeah, he's, wow. he's 42. He, uh, late start to his career. I mean, in 2019, he's the champion of the world, but things have changed. At the end of the day, for Woodley, if he wants to go out on his own terms, all the power to him. I mean, Anderson Silva's like 75, and he's about to fight Chael. Uh, well, yeah, hopefully if it's a fight, it's a, it's a fair fight against someone who's in a similar point in his career. But I don't anticipate Tyron coming out there and looking like a world beater. Yeah, I mean, he's lost four in a row. Last win coming in 2018 against Darren Till. Lost against Camaro, Gilbert, Colby, and then uh, Luke there. In, in 2021, I mean, you're, you're approaching you know, three-plus years since we've seen him in the cage. Um, I would imagine that means he's probably trying to get a fight uh, in the PFL, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, Conor McGregor coming out and saying that uh, he wants to have three fights in 2024. Uh, he's saying this, quote, I'll do three this year, June, September, December. We got Chandler in June, obviously. September, Spear is Mexican Independence Day. Potentially someone with a Mexican heritage, maybe a Nate Diaz. I think Diaz would be perfect. I don't know the ins and outs. I kind of thought that would be a lovely one. I'm up for anyone, any of them. That's the truth. I really don't care who it is. I'm just, I'm back. I want the activity. And I've said this before, and God willing, please, this is the time. I feel and I believe that this is. Whoever it is, there's loads of them. That it could be, they're uh, queuing them. There've been loads of call outs, so I'm excited about that. Line them up. I'm going to knock them down. Of course, 
Uh, in the same uh, conversation he had, he also picked Dustin Poirier and knocked out Islam Mahachev. It's like he's already trying to plan his, you know, a, a, a fourth matchup against Dustin Poirier here. Um, no way Connor fights three times in 2024. I think he's only going to fight once. I think it's just going to be the Chandler fight, and that's it. And and he's not going to fight in the spear. I would not. Because the strategy for the UFC is simple. If Connor fights, there's going to be no other big fight on this card. If Connor fights, there will not be another championship fight on the pay per view. They do not want to share the revenue. That so that automatically disqualifies them because I believe they're going to do the O'Malley fight in the spear. So that's not happening. Connor has said statements like this before: "Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you." Not going to get fooled by this. It would be great for this sport. It would be exciting. We're about to rank the top fights. Clearly, the Connor fight is going to be a part of the top fights of the of the month, no doubt. Connor is one of the most exciting fighters in the history of the sport. Would love to see him fight three times. If I had to bet my money on it, I think the only time we see him fight in 2024 is at UFC 303. I, I would agree with you. That. Exactly. I would be, I mean, you know, if you told me there was a betting on Connor fights three times in, in 2024, there would definitely be plus money on, on that one. As we did the show last week, UFC 304 fights were not announced. Later that day, Dana White did announce it. Leon Edwards, Paul Muhammad will be the main event. Tom Aspinall defending the interim heavyweight title against Curtis Blades, which... So if Tom Aspinall wins, does Bruce Buffer go and still interim heavyweight champion? Yeah, I think so. I think he does. What a, what a freaking farce. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I'm happy that Bilal got this matchup. I mean, he he was a, clearly the number one deserving guy here. He gets the matchup here. Uh, Muhammad Kaya, Mel Cop also on this car. You got to imagine that's potentially a, a title eliminator at 125. We'll see if Mel Cop makes it a fight night. Um, the Bobby Green, Patty Pimblett fight, to me, screams the UFC is saying, no more showcase fights for Patty Pimblett. Patty, we're about to find out. Has your boxing defense improved? Yeah, this is a damn good card, man. I'm excited for it. It really is one of the better pay-per-view lineups. Yeah, I mean, and, and obviously load up with a lot of English talent here. We'll see maybe Lerone Murphy uh, gets this one as well. Arnold Allen, Chika Kadze, uh, a part of this one. And uh, Leon Edwards, add him to the list of people who, who have won I mean, the Conor McGregor matchup. So we'll see uh, if that happens. And the other news item I wanted to mention here uh, is UFC is planning to be flexible in their next broadcast rights deal, including a potential in traditional pay review. Mark Shapiro talking about essentially uh, what I would say is describing essentially an NFL Sunday ticket for UFC pay-per-views. I would love to see that. God knows what that price tag would be, whether it's ESPN, it's Amazon, Paramount, Peacock, whoever it may be. God knows how expensive that uh, yearly pass is going to cost us. Yeah, but it could save you a lot of money because of how expensive we already. The amount of money we spend on pay-per-views every year is pretty crazy. Uh, I would imagine we'll see the sport look different because it does seem as though we are in changing times in the TV sports landscape. Obviously, the NBA is going to, Sign with multiple people, turn or not one of them. Things are changing. Uh, so I would imagine, I mean, WWE is going to Netflix. Netflix is going live with so much of their crap. Uh, man, I would not be surprised if Netflix gets in the UFC business. I really wouldn't because that would be just, I mean, if Netflix gets WWE and UFC, they become such a player in live sports. No, oh, no question about it. I mean, look, it's I don't know if you you caught the Charles Barkley little uh, little dig in last night, basically saying, "Yeah, we only got one more year left, fellas." Yeah, Let glory run, glory run. It's gonna yeah, be uh, yeah. fun to watch, but yeah, it's sad to watch. Yeah, sad. it's going to be sad to, you know, because Inside the NBA, by far, is the best studio show out there. Uh, now let's move ahead to what we're going to see here in the month of June in terms of MMA as we're going to do our monthly draft here. Of course, look at some of the notable events coming up here in June. We got uh, UFC 302, UFC Louisville, UFC Vegas 93, UFC Saudi Arabia, and UFC 303. Also, we have three PFL events. We have a Bellator event. We have a Ryzen event. So Daniel and I are going to sit here and draft our top five fights. And I was telling Daniel as we started the show here, or right before we started showing the show, like to me, there is a very clear top five fights. And I'll be very interested if we both kind of have those same top five fights here. You want to go first or second? 
I'll go. Uh, I'll go second. Okay. All right. I to me, I think the clear number one fight of the month has got to be the best fighter on the planet right now, Islam Mahachev, defending the lightweight title against Dustin Poirier at UFC 302 next week. I'm glad I went second. <laughs> you look at my big board, Jason. If you look at my big board, I have that as the number two fight. Is Islam Mahachev the best fighter that's fighting in June? Yeah, no question. Is Dustin Poirier the second best fighter that's fighting in June? Yes, no question. But I want a fight that's going to get people in the seats. Give me Connor and Chandler, number one. Is it a more interesting fight from a sporting perspective? No, not really. Actually, I could say yes, it is. Because I think Islam's going to go out there and, and beat the hell out of Dustin. Versus Connor Chandler, there's a lot more. I don't know what's going to happen. And also, it involves Connor McGregor, who's one of the most fascinating people in the sport. You know, if he's not fighting, he's doing something crazy like, like uh, you know, doing interviews with Jake Gyllenhaal that makes you ask some questions. But uh, my third pick, buddy, is going to be, or my second pick, third pick of the draft, I'm going to go Whitaker Jemayev, UFC ABC. That's my number three fight. That was my number two fight. Wow. I got your number two with my number three. I'm a, I'm a draft genius. Now, n- number three was Connor Chandler. I mean, look, from a, a excitement level, whatnot, I mean, look, the Connor Chandler pay review is going to be the most talked about, but like when you look at that three hundred three car, God, it is it's ass. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, oh. it's one of those cards of if you're the UFC, if Connor McGregor does not make it to fight night, they're in trouble. Oh, I yeah, mean, cancel the pay per view. You're just going to make it a fight night card at that point. You're just going to have to. Um, okay, so you know my number four and five fights are stop are still there. One of them, I'll go to UFC 302. Give me the co-main event. I'm going to go Strickland Costa. And I think my third pick, is, it might surprise you. I don't know. Let's see if we have the same top five. Horiguchi versus Sergio Pettis at Ryzen 47. Damn it. That one did surprise me. I didn't <laughs> even see that one. That's a great one. You, you got to go down that topology rabbit hole to see all these MMA events out there. And I was like, I was oh. going down there and I was like, oh, that has got to be in there. Oh, you, you need. I, I figured I was like Daniel's got to have this fight on his list. We go on this podcast. I don't. I. I just honestly. I just looked at all the events you had listed on upcoming events on our run sheet, and we started this podcast. And you're like Daniel. There's a clear top five, and I was like, I guess Tyra and Perez is a good fight. <laughs> I, I. I. I was like. I was like. I was like. What's the fifth fight he's talking about? Like, is he talking about <laughs> Valentin Modovsky? But yeah, oh man, Pettis and Horaguchi is a really good fight. I did not know that was happening. This yeah, this, month. yeah, this is on uh, June the 9th, Ryzen forty seven. Horaguchi mm. uh, Pettis at bantamweight. Mm. Uh, uh, also, Juan Archuleta is a part of this card. Um, uh, Spike Carlisle is a part of it as well. Um, Johnny Case is a part of it as well. Well, damn it, no, that was a hell of a pick. Um, not not that I was going to be able to take it anyway because of my positioning, but. Uh, you could have got that last pick of the draft, buddy, because um, I just didn't have it on my radar. But I'm going to go Alex Perez, Tetsuro Tyra. Got some fl- got some flyweights, main event in the fight night. And then <laughs> that's <sighs> things take a pretty big um, – there's, there's a big gap and to what's next. And uh, give mm-hmm. me – screw it. Screw it. Give me Andre Muniz versus Ikram Alice Garoff. Uh, Ikram is one of the most exciting fighters on the UFC's roster that's up and coming. So give me Ikram. All right, so I'll go with my four and five pick, and like you said, it, it, it's it, it's a clear drop off after my top five. Uh, I'll go with the UFC Louisville main event of Kandir and Imovov, and then for my final pick, this is I mean I could go a lot of different places, just because I think this fight's going to be just fun. Nico Price versus Alex Morono. Oh, that's a really yeah. You're, you 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 called a good one. Price Morono is going to be a fun fight. Um, when I look at what's available, I got the last pick of the draft. What's available? Um, you look at the Bellator PFL conglomerate of the fighters who are actually having fight: Clay Collard, Mads Burnell, Koreshkov, mm-hmm. Yamauchi, uh, Moldovsky, Vassell, Jason Jackson versus Ramazan Kermagomedov. 
man, I've never heard of before, but I'm assuming he's really good. Um, so those are all good fights. We have Pavlovich and Volkov. We have Kevin Holland and Michael Alexinchuk. We have Adam Borax and Brett Johns. We have Dominic Reyes and Dustin Jacoby. Those are all good fights, but I'm going to follow your formula with my last fight. I'm going to go with the fight. I think it's just going to be fun. I'm going to go Cub Swanson versus Andre Feely. Okay. I just think that's going to be a fun fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of other notable fights, I just kind of put in my list that, that we didn't talk about. Uh, Almeida versus Romanoff. Um, obviously, how both these guys bounce back. We've seen uh, gas tank issues have clearly been an issue there for Romanoff. And, of course, we all know what Jalton Almeida can do. Uh, Dom Reyes, that's Jacoby, I think is, is another um, potential fun fight. That's uh, the co main event UFC Louisville. Also, UFC Louisville. Uh, Soriano versus uh, Baeza, I think, is is another one there. Uh, Pavlovich versus Volkov there at uh, UFC Saudi Arabia. Uh, some PFL matchups that um, I put down on my list. Madovsky, Vassell, James, Fortune, Carmouche, Want to be Wilkins, Silveria, Laughlin, Gonzalez, Go- Gochi versus Koreshkov uh, a little bit. Uh, then you had mentioned the Jason Jackson the fight there. Uh, there at, at Bellator, Dublin. So I mean, there's a there's a ton of MMA to come. Uh, of course, no MMA this weekend, so everyone can hopefully go out there and have a a good Memorial Day weekend. And uh, you know, you know, I'm pretty much uh, I'm not, I, I, I'm kind of positive I'm not really working much this weekend. So uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll find ways to whether it's going out there, you know, throwing some darts, playing some pool, maybe hanging out at the pool. Because I don't know if it's um, what it's like in uh, the Rio Grande right now. Uh, well, this weekend is the official "quote unquote" start of summer. I feel like, from a weather perspective, summer here in Tampa Bay area started several weeks ago. Oh yeah, it's hot as hell, man. Uh, I've cut some time down on cooking. I just put my raw chicken in the car when I get ready to leave work, and by the time I come out, it's all the way done. It is hot as hell. It's getting hotter every day. I look at the forecast. They had this big map, and it's like if it's purple, it's extreme heat, and just every day more and more purple until we look like freaking Barney's butthole. So, uh, yeah, it's hot as hell, Jason. I don't know how we're going to survive it. I mean, we're going to be doing this podcast in 2034, and you're going to be like, man, Daniel, it's 127 degrees in Florida today. I'm going to be like, I don't know how we're doing it, buddy, but we're doing it. Look, I have lived in the Tampa Bay area all my life, and every year I go, it's never this hot. It's like it's hotter every year. I mean, I, I'm looking at it, just looking at the uh, the Apple weather. Today, high of 96. Tomorrow, 94. Saturday, 94. Sunday, 94. Monday, 95. And um, it looks like we got no rain coming at all. <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh, a lot of time spent indoors. A lot of time spent indoors for your dude, boy. I, dude, hard. I was... I was leaving the office on Tuesday. I, I left in the middle of the afternoon and just walking from the office downstairs to get to the car. I get in the car. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> this AC needs yeah. to kick on quick. It is hot as balls in here. Yeah. Thank God for those cars that start on. Mine doesn't do it, but it's a good invention or you can start that baby on as you're walking to it because uh, those first 15 to 20, 35 seconds as that AC kicks in, it feels like a saw torture trap. Yeah, man. You know, I think it, you know. Obviously, you know, it's it's one of those weekends where I, I feel like you want to get in front of the grill. Whether you uh, maybe make some steaks, maybe it's some hot dogs, some hamburgers, maybe do all three. I, I I don't grill yet, but I'm starting to cook. Uh, one day out of the week, I'm following a YouTube tutorial, so I just learned how to. Last week, I made a meatloaf. This week, last night, I made a tuna melt. Uh, so I can't grill yet, Jason. I will learn. I'm becoming a domesticated adult. But right now, I'm just sticking to the kitchen. I, I feel like there may be a certain female I should I should reach out to and say, all right, so is Daniel a good cooker of food or not? Dude, I don't know. I mean, she could be lying to me. She could be lying to me. But she said I'm doing good. I mean, granted, I'm looking at these recipes, and they're not the healthiest recipes. He's like, you want to get this piece of bread, and you want to cover it all in butter, both sides. And so I'm using a lot of cheese. I'm I'm taking a lot of shortcuts. What I'm eat, What I'm making isn't necessarily sustainable. But it's it's pretty good. It's pretty tasty. Again, I'm just following these recipes. I'm not. I'm not freestyling. I'm going like by the book. And uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure but I'll probably have yeah. some some quality chicken wing product this weekend. It's kind of happened. I mean, I had those. If, if people have never had Outback Steakhouse wings, I'm telling you, just go do them. Okay. okay. They're they're. I, 
I I had I had gone out I've gone out back for years. I'd never tried their wings. And about six months ago, I, I you know I tried them and I was like, holy shit, these are fucking delicious. Okay, I'm with you. If I ever go to I don't got an out back in my backyard. I don't. It's on the valley, but if I go to an out back. I'm going to get myself some chicken wings. I will yeah. get a blooming onion and I'll get some chicken wings. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. So hopefully everyone has a, a great weekend out there. We appreciate you too, this episode of the podcast. Of course, new episodes come out every Thursday. Of course, uh, next week we'll be here to get you ready for UFC 302. So we'll talk to you next week right here on the MA Report Podcast.